Well, welcome to the 700 Club, and thanks so much for joining with us. Nuclear facilities, weapons factories, missile and drone launch sites, these are just some of the targets in Iran that Israel might hit in the coming days. The Biden administration continues to warn Israel against escalating the conflict. To ease the tension, they're now proposing greater economic sanctions on Tehran. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu explained to young military recruits why Israel must respond to Iran's attack. Iran stands behind Hamas, behind Hezbollah, behind others. But we're determined to win there and defend ourselves in all arenas. Analysts speculate Israel could hit Iranian nuclear facilities or factories and launch sites that made the drone and missile attack possible. Firing 110 ballistic missiles directly to Israel will not get scot-free. We will respond in our time, in our place, in the way that we will choose. On Tuesday, the IDF displayed one of the more than 100 ballistic missiles fired at Israel. These uh, ballistic missiles are ones that has 500 kilos of explosives in the warhead. We are talking about over 110 ballistic missiles coming from Iran aiming towards Israel. These are 60 tons of explosives directly to Israel. On the diplomatic front, the U.S. continues to pressure Israel against a retaliatory strike and has announced it's ready to apply economic sanctions against Iran's missile and drone program. Critics point out that the Biden administration has waived such sanctions in the past. We lifted or waived the sanctions that we had, this administration, on the drones and, and the missiles and on the energy. This is giving them $100 billion in cash to fund their terror operations. And that's why we're seeing this. Senior policy advisor for the U.S.-Israel Education Association, Ari Sakhar, says most citizens want to send Iran a message. Israelis, I believe, think that we need to return fire. Iran cannot be let off with a tongue lashing for, for what they did. There must be a price for impinging upon the security of a sovereign nation. Soccer believes, like many here in Israel, that divine intervention was at work during the attack. I have an axiomatic belief in the existence of a God, a God who pays attention and who cares, especially about what goes on in Israel. And everything I see reinforces that belief. So when I see 99% um, of, um, of rockets that are fired at Israel, of uh, threats, missiles, cruise missiles that are fired at Israel being shot down, um, I wake up the next morning and I thank God for it. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, we thank God for it as well. When you when you look at the stats, the, the companies that make these missile defense um, uh, uh, systems, they say it, it's only good against 90 percent of them. And so you look at that and look at, well, 99 percent were, were intercepted. You, you just go, wow, that these are amazing stats. And you take a step back and go, no, but God, uh, he, he, he seems to have his hand in, in these affairs. I hope he has a hand in our administration, and I hope it gives them unusual wisdom for, for these days. I've been praying for unusual wisdom for the leadership of Israel and that they would have unusual unity as well. They seem to be divided, uh, and now more than ever, there needs to be unity. But within our administration, can we please give up the failed policy that we've had for Iran since the Obama administration? where somehow we think through negotiation and through that kind of peace strategy, uh, they're going to stop their ideology of hate. It's quite clear they're not going to. How many times do they need to attack international shipping? How many times do they need to attack the refineries in Saudi Arabia? How many times do they need to attack our military forces in Iraq and in Syria? How many times do they need to attack Israel before we wake up to, well, they're the real threat in the Middle East? It's not the Iranian people. They've been protesting against their own government for some time. Their own government, in response, lynches them in the public square. And if you're a woman and you're wearing your scarf wrong, you're going to be beaten to death very publicly. You, you look at this kind of atrocious action, how in the world could we ever release money to them? 
How could we ever say, well, it's okay for you to export your drone and missile technology? This is, uh, it's absolutely insane to think that somehow or other they're going to come to a peace table and treat you fairly at that table. They're not going to do it. Of all times in history, now's the time to be really tough. Well, in other news, and I've just got to call out the Republicans, what in the world are you doing? It just makes no sense to me that you, know, you could have a couple of members who disagree on a single bill, and now they want to completely change the government in the middle of an election year. It's just absolutely insane. But from impeaching a cabinet secretary to moving against the House Speaker, Congress is in turmoil. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John. Thanks, Gordon. The Senate will decide the fate of the Homeland Security Secretary after House Republicans filed articles of impeachment against him. They accuse Alejandro Mayorkas of failing to protect the southern border. Meanwhile, House Speaker Mike Johnson, as Gordon was just saying, is facing threats of a Republican revolt over a proposed bill to send aid to Ukraine. CBN Charlene Aaron reports. Two House Republicans walked the articles of impeachment through the U.S. Capitol Tuesday, led by the House clerk and sergeant at arms, setting in motion a potential trial to remove Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas from office. GOP House members accused Mayorkas of violating the Constitution by refusing to enforce border security laws. Earlier, Mayorkas faced tough questions from House members on the department's budget. CBN News national security correspondent Caitlin Burke followed the hearing. This scheduled appropriations discussion felt more like a literal trial run of what would be heard in any Senate impeachment proceeding. Lawmakers immediately fired accusations against Secretary Mayorkas, including that he's failed to fulfill his oath to protect the United States. You refuse to comply with the laws passed by Congress, and you've breached the public trust. You facilitated and encouraged record levels of illegal immigration since your first day in office. Congress has not updated our immigration enforcement laws since 1996, 28 years ago. And only Congress can deliver on our need for more Border Patrol agents, asylum officers, and immigration judges, facilities, and technology. While trying to oust Mayorkas, Speaker Mike Johnson is facing a challenge of his own, as some House Republicans threatened to expel him after he outlined a plan to send assistance to Ukraine. Representative Thomas Massey, a strong critic of additional Ukraine aid, says he'll join Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene in her motion to vacate the Speaker's chair, a move that could set up a floor vote to oust Johnson. After announcing his decision to his Republican colleagues, Congressman Massey posted on X, quote, he should pre-announce his resignation so we can pick a new speaker without ever being without a GOP speaker, an idea the House Speaker quickly rejected. I am not resigning, and it is, um, it is in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. The opposition has slowed Speaker Johnson's efforts to get several foreign aid bills, including one for Israel, to the floor this week. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thank you, Charlene. Well, staying on the topic of international aid, relief agencies say the war-torn African nation of Sudan is getting only a trickle of the help needed to stave off a humanitarian crisis. One year since civil war broke out, nearly 18 million people, including 14 million children, face food insecurity. Eight million people are displaced and thousands of schools and hospitals are out of operation. Sudan's tiny Christian community has been particularly hit hard. More than 150 churches have been destroyed and many missionaries and other workers forced to flee the communities that they serve. Well, a Christian aid organization is serving victims of the war in Myanmar. A team recently visited a hidden hospital that's providing life-saving care to those caught in the crossfire. Chuck Holton takes us to this secret facility in the jungles of Myanmar. Here in Myanmar, a long-running conflict between the military rulers and ethnic minorities has intensified. Amidst the chaos, humanitarians known as the Free Burma Rangers provide critical medical care to those in need. So we've just arrived at a hidden hospital deep in the jungle in Kareni State. The reason it's hidden is because the Burmese army makes a habit of bombing hospitals, even civilian ones. 
This particular hospital was partially funded by the Free Burma Rangers, and they are doing everything they can to keep it hidden to the point where we had to hike in here for about 15 minutes through the forest instead of driving up here so that they can't find it as well. Hundreds of people have come here shot and wounded, especially since the coup. Every hospital I know of in Kareni State has been bombed and destroyed, including the hospital this started at. Before we could finish this interview, two gravely wounded Kareni men were brought in and yeah, workers yeah. sprang into shot. action. Hey, we got it, we got it. Hey, Joe, Joe. You got a wound, two wounded here. Hey, you can take photo and video. The all-volunteer staff work under great personal risk to treat the wounded and sick in the midst of war. Among them is Tom Avery, a German surgeon who felt called to use his skills for those in need. In the recent years, I always had it in my heart as a strong desire to do this type of work. I just couldn't find the right opportunity and also not the right organization for me, which would combine Christian faith and humanitarian work. Once this bullet or shrapnel or fragment hits the body, this potential, that like this, some part of its kinetic energy will be transferred to the body. After praying and after thinking about it a long time, it just seemed the right fit. During our visit, enemy scout planes flew over looking for the hospital each day, giving our team a taste of what life is like for civilians here. The Burma Army has now called in fighter jets, and so I'm taking shelter in this drainage ditch. I can hear the jet right overhead. You all right? Yeah. You staying here? Come on, one more. Hey, Chuck. Yeah. Lord, please bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Behind us. Yep. Good job, Chuck. Thank you, Jesus. Help miss again. There's a growing need for this kind of care as consistent bombing drives more villagers from their homes. Eubanks Group is now helping fund a second hospital, also hidden in the jungle. So the building you see over there is the female ward. It's donated by the Free Burma Ranger. Last three years, I have never imagined that kind of life. Living in a jungle and walking that kinds of thing every day to save the lives are very difficult. As the civil war here continues, the Burmese army is losing ground to a united front of militias and defectors, and hospitals like this one are a desperately needed lifeline for the families displaced by the conflict. From the jungles of Burma, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Christian compassion and boldness to meet so much struggling around the world. Gordon? Oh, you just admire the Eubanks for their courage to go to that area. Um, the, the Karen, the Kareni, uh, many Christians in the United States don't know this, but they're Christian, and they've been Christian for 200 years. Uh, they were converted by Adoniram Judson, who went to Burma uh, so long ago. And in this conflict, it is an ethnic conflict. It's also a religious conflict where the Burmese, who are Buddhist, want to drive them out. They want to exterminate them. They've been at this for a long period of time. And the world seems to turn away from it. Uh, if you want to talk about genocide, ethnic cleansing, that's exactly what this is. And the Karen, the Kareni are essentially stateless. They can't, uh, they, they are in refugee camps along the border with Thailand, but Thailand won't give them papers. They can't get employed. They can't travel. They can't go to another country. They can't do anything. And in this, the world seems to be silent. Let's let our voices be heard. This should not be happening in today's world. It's the latest battle in the abortion wars. Next week, the Supreme Court will consider whether emergency room physicians can be forced to perform abortions. The arguments will focus on what constitutes a medical emergency. Charlene Aaron explains. 
The Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act requires hospital emergency rooms to provide medical care and stabilization for all patients. The White House wants that measure to include abortion access, even in states where the procedure is banned. As the high court hears arguments over the issue, pro-life doctors are holding out hope for another victory. We're talking about elective abortions being forced on doctors to perform them by a federal fiat. Roger Severino of the Heritage Foundation says deliberate misinformation surrounds the law, also known as EMTALA. There are some circumstances where you do have conditions where the life of the mother is at risk, and doctors are still able in every pro-life state to save the life of the mother, even if it incidentally results in the loss, tragically, of an unborn child. That's not what we're talking about here. Under the law, hospitals that receive Medicare funds must provide emergency medical care. The Justice Department argues abortions can fall under emergency medical care, so health care providers should perform them. Earlier this year, a federal appeals court ruled Texas doctors aren't obligated to perform abortions under the law. The ruling followed numerous lawsuits from women who live in Texas, Tennessee, and Idaho, saying due to their state's bans, they were denied abortions despite having dangerous pregnancy complications. The state doesn't care about the lives of their constituents. Last summer in a Texas courtroom, women testified the state's abortion ban put their lives at risk. I had just been given the worst news of my life. Um, and I was terrified. 18 weeks into her pregnancy, Amanda Zorowski's water broke. After developing sepsis, she says she nearly died. While a number of states with abortion bans allow for exceptions if the mother's life is in danger, many experts say it's not clear when those exceptions can be applied. Dr. Susan Bain, board member of the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists, told CBN News clarification is vital. I do think that physicians, other health care pra practitioners, um, it is the responsibility of hospital systems, the legal system, to make sure that doctors um, and health care practitioners really understand the law. Um, because we're not attorneys. Severino argues that abortion activists are using the issue to spread fear among pregnant women with health challenges. It's politically convenient for the left that is very pro-abortion to try to scare people. There are so many instances of pro-life doctors who are out there saying, look, we do this all the time, we're OBGYNs, we know the tough cases. The most common ones we see, I already talked about preterm rupture of membranes, but also hemorrhage um, and then high blood pressure that's severe enough, something called preeclampsia or eclampsia. Mm -hmm. When we intervene for medical emergencies, we can do it without an abortion. We can separate the mom and the baby, but our intention is to hopefully have two living individuals when we're done. Bain adds, today's politically charged environment also makes decisions challenging for any doctor. We've really seen a movement in in our our profession of OBGYN to where instead of doing our jobs of taking care of both, the answer to any risk factor is, well, go ahead and have an induced abortion and just eliminate the risk factor. And I'm like, mm -hmm. time out. Severino points out training is now required for many med students. This is a sad thing. Now we see this in medical schools where the accrediting bodies are saying you have to train in abortion to get a medical license. So students are being forced to uh, assist in these abortions or trying to move it instead of a opt-in as mm -hmm. an opt-out to yeah. pressure medical students to do abortions when the overwhelming majority of the profession they went into medicine to save lives, not to end lives. Meanwhile, Severino says if doctors are forced to violate their consciences by performing abortions, many of them will quit practicing medicine altogether. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. I think one of the fundamental problems is we're looking to the court system to solve these issues for us. And, and that was the problem initially with Roe versus Wade. Even liberal Supreme Court justices say it was wrongly decided. When the court starts to legislate, and particularly legislate on highly charged social issues like abortion, 
you're, you're not going to end up with a, a system that really does work. Democracy is certainly messy, and we're seeing it uh, play out in state after state after Roe was overturned. And now we've got to come to agreement as uh, the people of the United States. But that's how our Constitution was set up. It's always up to we the people. It's not up to unelected judges. And when we transfer power to them saying, please solve this issue for us, we're, we're delegating authority that the Constitution doesn't let us do. We have to decide, and we have to decide through our elected representatives, not through the court system. All that said, I hope we end up with a culture where we don't enforce ideology, that we allow freedom of conscience. That is a culture that is American, where you have freedom of belief and speech and freedom of conscience. We've, we've got to uphold that individual right as we move forward in time so that we don't lose our own identity. What I'm seeing on both sides is a let's enforce ideology, and, and that is not something that, that we should be doing. At the same time, I'm very pro-life, and I believe in the sanctity of life, and I want to see a culture of life, not a culture of death. Let's have that. Let's uphold life that we stand for that. We believe in that, and we want to have a future because children are the future. Ashley? Carrie Sheffield is a columnist and broadcaster who earned a full tuition to Harvard. Uh, she's also managed billions of dollars at Wall Street firms. She's visited every continent before she was 30, ran the Marine Corps Marathon, and was once named Most Inspiring New Yorker. Carrie Sheffield is a columnist and broadcaster in Washington, D.C., a Harvard grad. She's also a policy analyst with the Independent Women's Forum. Given her success, no one would ever guess that Carrie's childhood was one of poverty and extreme abuse. In a memoir, Motorhome Prophecies, Carrie tells how she not only escaped a nightmare, but came to forgive her tormentor. All right, everyone. Well, please welcome to the 700 Club, Carrie Shuffled. Carrie, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Ashley. Of course, you look beautiful in your pink suit. <laughs> We're, you know, very spring today. Yes. But let's get into your childhood. What was it like growing up? Um, period, because it was a very tumultuous childhood. You were uh, the fifth of eight children. Can you just take us back to that time? Yeah, so eight biological children and my mom and then our dad. So 10 people. Wow. We lived in motorhomes, sheds, mm -hmm. tents. My mother gave birth to my brother when the family was living in a tent. When I took my ACT exam to go to college, we were living in a shed in the Ozarks with no running water. And, but we also had houses sometimes. So I say that we would careen between a first world existence and a third world existence in America. So it was very chaotic. Uh, in the end, I went to 17 public schools and homeschool. Wow. So I went to two violent, very violent, urban inner city schools mm -hmm. where I was bullied for being white and my black friends were bullied for being friends with the white girl. I talk in the book about that experience because it forever enshrined for me the yeah. importance of school choice because they were predominantly black environment and these kids were trapped because you had bomb scares, uh, you had to wait through metal detectors. It was like juvenile detention to mm -hmm. just go to school. Mm -hmm. And so that's why a lot of these kids end up going to prison. It's a school yeah. to prison pipeline. And so, but I also went to rural schools. So it was, it was, it was a lot of chaos. Oh my gosh. Well, the, the book is titled Motor Home Prophecies. What, what's the meaning behind that? So I titled it because my father, and I'm very clear to describe what I believe what he did to us was a cult environment, mm -hmm. as opposed to the official Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormon Church sometimes. So he created, in my view, an offshoot Mormon cult that was not sanctioned by the LDS Church. He was eventually excommunicated from the LDS Church. Mm -hmm. And he would claim that he was going to be president someday, and that God had anointed him, and that he in order to fulfill this, we had to travel around the country trying to convert people to be Mormon. Well, you obviously had a very interesting relationship with your father. Um, something happened to you when you were 10 years old. Can you tell us that story? Because that really just paints a picture of what was going on with him and with your family. 
Yeah, so at the time we were, we had a house at that time. Like I said, we would go between first world and third world. So that time we had a house mm. and there was a basement to the house. It was a modest house in the, the city of Orem, Utah. And I was playing soccer with a semi-deflated soccer ball and my foot caught on it and I fell back and hit the corner of a wall and the back of my head, there was a gaping gash and I was bleeding and it was, it was clear that I needed stitches and we had no money, we had no health insurance. My dad thought health insurance was for schmucks. And so he said to me, because it was around Christmas time, look, you can either go to the ER, I'll take you there, but we'll have to pay out of cash or out of pocket, um, but that means your siblings have no Christmas presents. So you choose. <laughs> so I had seven siblings, or, you know, seven siblings. It's like, mm -hmm. do I want to be the Christmas Grinch <laughs> by getting wow. my head sewn up? Or yeah. <laughs> so I, ch I chose to grin and bear it. Uh, knelt down on my little teddy bear. We have this little couch thing, and he sewed the back of my head up. Wow. And something that you, you talk about too. I mean, sometimes you guys would eat boiled grass for dinner. Yeah, yeah, that happened. Uh, and also we, we've been on welfare and, yeah. we, and the Mormon church has a very strong food welfare program, but unfortunately some of the food had weevils in it. Wow. And the boiled grass was when we were, I was in first grade and I'll never forget, we pulled up to the city park, we had no food, we had been on welfare, but because we were in the motor home, we were unplugged from getting the benefits. And so my mom just made some bouillon, little bouillon cubes mm -hmm, and she mm -hmm. boiled it with grass and that's what we ate and oh what was really upsetting about it as they say in the book was that when my father came home he was more upset that someone would find out that we were eating grass instead of the fact that his children were eating grass wow well 18 years old you you move away you break free from your family like how did you even find the courage to do that and how did you actually do that so I say in the book that sometimes life's most wrenching crucibles can lead us to our most propelling mo uh, moments of freedom. Yeah. And so for me, one of those wrenching moments was by that point I had a schizophrenic brother. Later on I had two schizophrenic brothers mm -hmm. of my five brothers. Mm -hmm. And the oldest uh, schizophrenic brother, when I was 17, he groped me and tried to rape me. And that assault really became the catalyst for me leaving because I knew at that point I wasn't safe. I can't yeah. be in a close, confined quarters with someone who has these sick fantasies about me. Mm -hmm. And I, but at the same time, I also wanted to honor my dad and his prophetic call, what he claimed was his prophetic call. Right. And so I went on what I call my first investigative project, is my father a prophet? Mm -hmm. And I went through this process and eventually came to a discernment that I did not believe that he was, or if he ever was, that he was a false prophet. And so I told him, I'm, I wanna go away to college. And he raised his right hand to the square like he was making an oath. And he said, I prophesy in the name of Jesus, you'll be raped and murdered if you leave, which is very much a cult-like thing to do. Wow. And that actually, what you, that kind of investigative thing that you went on led you to leave the Mormon church, right? Yeah, that became my second big investigative project. Yeah. So I left home, I went to college. I, for my freshman year, I went to a state college in Missouri and then transferred to Brigham Young University, the LDS Mormon College in Utah. And it was the summer after my, my junior year while at BYU that I, or kind of during that period, I went on my second big investigative journalism project. Do I believe the LDS mm. church is true. Is it what God wants for my life? And through that discernment again, I came to the realization that I could not believe it any longer. And mm. that was actually in some ways far more devastating for me. It was the first time that I'd ever felt suicidal after deciding to leave the LDS church. Yeah, so you struggled obviously for many years with depression and PTSD and suicidal thoughts. I mean, because you went through so much at such a young age, how were you able to find true healing from all of that? Yeah, so I, I part of why I wrote the book is because we're in this broader context, like my personal story, God chose to give me a 20 year lead on what's happening right now because mm. today's young people are facing record suicide and depression yeah. levels. And our country has the highest suicide rate since 1941, since coming out of the Great Depression. And I believe what we have, it's a spiritual and a moral depression because mm. back then it was an economic depression. We're so much more wealthy now but we're so much more poor spiritually. Yeah. And so for me, what eventually led to my healing was my Christian baptism. Because mm. I, after leaving the LDS church, I 
became so angry at God because I had been abused yeah. brutally in yeah. the name of God right. to have someone use the name of Jesus to pronounce a curse over you. Wow. You can understand why I didn't like Jesus Absolutely. for a long time, you Absolutely. know? Yeah. And so it was a very unexpected series of events that I lay out in the book of how I eventually became a Christian. And it was through that walk that I was able to forgive him mm. and to know that there's a script that people, abusers put on your life and yeah. in your mind. And then there's a script that the Bible says and that God wants you to put over your mind. So I had to learn a new script. And you say that the baptism was like the happiest day of your life. It was. It, it really was because I felt like I, I mean, it, it's, it certainly was not uh, the end of the story. Mm. It was sort of the beginning. Right, yeah. But it felt yeah. like a new beginning because it felt like I can redeem something that was so horrific mm -hmm. in the name of God and to rewrite my understanding of who God is, it's not contingent on yeah. abusive man-made religion. Mm. The last thing I want to ask you, and I, I mean, we could talk for hours. There's <laughs> so much to your story, but obviously I'm sure there's a lot of people watching who might not have gone through the same things you have, but they've been abused in, in the name of God. The bad things have been done to them and it's really hard to forgive, but you got to that point where you were able to forgive your abuser, your biological father, what word of encouragement would you give to people who are watching right now who might just be struggling with that? Yeah, well, one thing I like to clarify when I'm talking about forgiveness to separate, there is the forgiveness and then there's the reconciliation. Mm. The forgiveness is all about your decision. That's the commandment from God to forgive. The reconciliation, whether you allow this person in your life or not, that's mm. contingent on them and their behaviors and their choices. So. Sometimes it's easy to confuse that. Yeah. The forgiveness is actually for your own healing. And it's scientifically proven by yeah. many studies that forgiveness is good for you, the, mm -hmm. the abused person, that it's good for your body, your mind, and your future. And so I encourage you to forgive for yourself. It's not about releasing or, mm -hmm. or uh, lying or trying to gloss over what was or done to you. excusing the sin. Or excusing it, exactly. Yeah. And I have a whole chapter on forgiveness specifically. Mm -hmm. I have a mentor who helped me forgive. I call him my forgiveness wow. mentor um, <laughs> because he forgave the murder of his wife. He was, his name is Reverend Anthony Thompson and his wife sadly was murdered by a white supremacist uh, in that shooting in Charleston in 2015. And he wrote a book, the title is called To Forgive. And through godly appointments, I he became a friend and a mentor of mine and he helped lead me through that process. That's absolutely, truly a miracle. Carrie, thank you just, gosh, so much for this book. Thank you for everything that you're doing. I know you're just leading so many people out of the darkness and into the glorious light of our, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So thank you so much. Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, Carrie's book is called Motor Home Prophecies, and it's available wherever books are sold. Highly encourage you, you get this. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. A mixed message for the Southern Baptist Convention. According to LifeWay's annual profile, the SBC lost over 1,200 churches in 2022. While that number was offset by new church plants, overall the denomination still had 416 fewer congregations in the previous year. However, the SBC has seen baptisms increase for the second straight year. Well, France's Catholic Church saw a record number of baptisms this past Easter. According to the Jesuit publication America, more than 12,000 people were baptized during one Easter service. About 5,000 were teenagers. That's an increase of 31 percent over last year. The report also says France's Catholic Church has seen a rise in baptisms over the last decade, most coming from non-religious families and about 5 percent from Muslim backgrounds. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. The Christian duo Jenny and Tyler have been making music together since they met in college. Well, today they're the parents of four children. When they're not performing, here's one of their favorite things to do as a family. Christian music duo Jenny and Tyler enjoy writing and performing songs about Jesus. When they're at home, they enjoy sharing stories and lessons from the Bible with their four kids. One of their favorite ways to do that is by watching Superbook. They're true to the scriptures, the, uh, the producers, the, it sounds good, it looks good. I love the stories and the, the morality that's brought into it. Knowing that it's something you can trust is a huge deal. 
because there's just so much out there that's like supposed to be about the Bible that's really wishy-washy or just not, not what you really want. And this is so true. Their kids love the adventures and the lessons. I like the characters and how they have problems. And when they go on adventures, they learn from them. I don't ever want to see this guitar again. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can teach my kid about this scripture, but also about how that applies to modern day. Chris walked out on his audition. <sighs> you said you wouldn't tell anyone. I like that um, they have a lesson at the beginning and end. Like it starts with something like that Chris or Joy or Gizmo do wrong. And then like the um, story in the Bible that they're doing like David and Goliath, like teaches um, Chris not to be nervous and stuff like that. I feel like the show has had a really sweet impact on them in that we'll read a scripture and they'll say, oh yeah, like, we, know, we already know about that, Dad, because we saw it in Superbook. I like Daniel and the lion. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me. He doesn't even have a scratch when he comes out, and, and he's not dead. All those gifts are blind! <laughs> oh, this is what Christmas is all about. I love that, like, the selfishness of Chris and Joy are present in episodes and how they deal with that. Chris wants all the presents for Christmas to himself, but then he goes on a super book adventure and he gives the presents to a little boy. Merry Christmas. I think that he learned to prefer people over himself. Jenny even has a favorite. One thing recently with like the Samuel episode, our girls now will say, maybe I need to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yes. I would tell my friends about Superbook because it teaches you about Jesus, and it's also fun and entertaining. As they've met other parents, Jenny and Tyler are quick to bring up Superbook. We met some yes. folks, found out they had three kids, three, uh, three and under, and we were like, have you heard of Superbook? Yeah. <laughs> because it's awesome. We would definitely recommend Superbook because it's been so impactful for our family. Superbook, we're trying to reach this generation with the stories of the Bible. And in Superbook, when the Bible characters are speaking, they're speaking verses directly from the Bible. His word never returns void. It always accomplishes its purpose. You can be a part of it. now. Here's some bad news. According to the latest study conducted by George Barna, less than one-third of young teens in America actually believe that God exists. That is something we've got to turn around. Barna's research also shown that the most critical time to reach a child is with the gospel is between the ages of 4 and 14. We call it the 414 window. Well, last year, and this is great news, 514 million viewers in more than 60 languages and dialects watched Superbook, watched at least one episode. That is incredible. This year, with your help, we can reach even more children. April is Childhood Evangelism Month at CBN. You can join with us to bring the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. All the heavy lifting of the production is done. Now we're into translation and we're into distribution. We want to make these episodes free for children in their own language through these wonderful apps that are on their smartphones and on tablets. We're also still on broadcast TV around the world. And you can help us with this to get the word out, especially right here in America where we need to let families know these episodes are free for you. All you have to do is download the Superbook app and you can have them for your children, your grandchildren. Uh, they'll all be there for them, along with a Bible and some games and some uh, other things, as well as how to know Jesus, how to, how to have him be part of your life. It's all made possible because people like you give. And for a gift of $20 monthly to CBN Animation, you can be part of the distribution and the translation going forward. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, or go to CBN Animation.
Ashley? We've got your email questions. You ready? We, we've got mail. And, <laughs> and Ashley's going to answer this first one, so I'm going to ask the question. Okay. Here's one from Heidi. On one of your programs, you had a testimony of a woman who claimed a healing from Gordon. It, well, I dispute it's not from me. It's from all healings from Jesus. I didn't die for you. Amen. <laughs> is it possible for several people to claim the same healing, or is a word of knowledge just for one person? I would say absolutely it is possible for several people to claim that same word of knowledge. Uh, but I'm going to let you do the heavy lifting mm. on why. Why is that? Well, the Bible says words are like seeds. Uh, so the word of God is a seed. Uh, the Greek is kerygma, and 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 you uh, and sperma. You, so you you have these seeds that you you spread out. Now, if a farmer goes out and plants wheat seed and then expects a corn cop, c crop, or, what do you think of the farmer? And it's like, well, that's being kind of dumb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, you 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 reap what you sow. Yeah. So if you're sowing words of healing then you're broadcasting that, and if it lands in good soil, this is all from Matthew chapter 13, if it lands in good soil, then it will produce a crop 30, 60, 100 fold. So here's a, here's a wonderful idea. The person who receives that word of knowledge, they get healed, and if they receive it and then say, I, I want to spread this word too, well, then you multiply again. Mm. So the, the crop that comes in the first time isn't the only crop. You can have multiple crops. You can take seed back from the harvest and plant it yet again. Now, here's something that is maybe new to you. When Jesus speaks, he is speaking for all time. Yeah. The words that are recorded in the Bible, uh, the words that are recorded that he spoke in the four Gospels, those are very powerful seeds. They're mm. still producing crops today. It's still being repeated. It still has the same power, force, and effect. I love how Reinhard Bonnke put it when he had his great revelation, started a healing ministry with blind people. Blind people, he, he preached on blindness, and all the blind people in the audience got healed. The word from him, for him was, Jesus spoke to him and said, my words in your mouth, have the same power that they have in mind. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. That's, that's awesome. That really is. That's awesome. And thank you for that answer. That was powerful. All right, guys. Well, this is coming from Jamie. She's asking, I would like to ask the host how to let go of grief. I was my parents' caretaker for four years, and I lost and buried both of my parents 22 months ago. Though I know they are both in heaven and would want me to continue on with life, I'm having such a hard time letting go. My heart is broken. Uh, Jamie, I'm right with you. Uh, this month, it's been two years since my mother died, uh, my father died last year. Uh, I would encourage you, don't let go of the grief uh, and don't try to push it away. It, it's okay to feel it. And it's okay to say, I just need some, some time. Uh, I'm, I'm having trouble just going back to their home. Uh, all their personal effects, all of these things, there's so many memories. And especially when I start looking at the pictures and whether it's pictures from their childhood, their college years, uh, us as a, uh, you know, the family uh, from when I was just a, a little one. Uh, the, these pictures bring back so many wonderful memories. I would encourage you to feel it. Uh, grief is something you feel, you experience. Uh, I will say from my experience, it comes in waves. And sometimes those waves can be really big and can overcome you. Uh, but the memory, here's something that may help. It's, a, it's from the book of Proverbs. The memory of the righteous is a blessing. So when you remember them, start thinking of the blessing that they have given you for your life and for your future. Because yes, indeed, they want you to live. They want you to have a life. They want to see you prosper and, and do wonderful things that they have trained you to do. That's why they spoke all these encouraging words over you and while they were alive. So live life, but let the memory be a blessing. The memory of a, the righteous is a blessing. And it's a wonderful phrase in Israeli society, Jewish culture that their memory will be a blessing and let it be a blessing for you as you experience that memory and have these moments that sometimes are overwhelming. But when you say, this is a blessing for me, it changes things 
and you can receive it and not be overwhelmed. Here's a word from Psalm 109. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Read the Bible today and let it be open to you. May you see the wondrous things that God has for you. God bless.